Good evening, everyone. It is January the 20th. It's about 624, 625. And we're going to go ahead and get started with our Wednesday night uh, Bible study question and answer period. For those that may not be aware, this is the time on Wednesday to where people who have submitted questions will be able to go through the Bible and have those questions answered for you. That way we'll be able to give some biblical clarity, hopefully, to someone who may be in need. <clears throat> Excuse me, still getting over this, this virus. So if I have to pause from, from time to time to, to cough and to clear my throat, uh, I'm certainly still recovering, trying to get back to 100%. Excuse me. <clears throat> Today was my first day back in the workforce, and uh, it went better than I expected. My first day being back at work in almost a week and a half, just trying to rest and to recover. Yet again, to everybody who has gone through this virus and everyone who may be going through it now, my heart and my prayers go out to you. And I pray that God will give you a speedy recovery, if not a miraculous recovery, if it is his will. Uh, my name is Rodney Smith, and I pastor New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church, where God has blessed me to be for over 13 years now. And I cannot imagine being with so great a people. Uh, good to see everybody logging on and getting prepared. Uh, Sister Verdi Davis, God bless you. To Deacon Marcus Davis, you and your wife, I'm still praying for you and Pray everything goes well in your home also. Uh, to all the Davis family, God bless you. And to everybody else, let's go ahead and get ourselves prepared. Let's go over this Bible question for tonight. Um, tonight we only have one Bible question, but it still is it's, it's fairly exhaustive. So we will, as always, need to have our Bibles with us. Um, I have one announcement I wanted to... Uh, announce and to bring to us and that is on february the 28th that is the fourth sunday of next month uh lord willing february the 28th the fourth sunday of next month at 3 p.m uh pastor buchanan <clears throat> has invited uh new hebron for us to come over and to share with them on their annual black history holiday so uh, they're going to have a Black History program February 28th at 3 p.m. And that's Shiloh on Hanger Hill. <coughs> Excuse me. Like I said, please, please be patient with me. Still getting over this, this lingering cough. Uh, seems to give a little bit of trouble to me. Just a little itching in my throat. Sister Bennett, God bless you and all of your family. Sister Waller, God bless you also. And all of your family. Once again, February the 28th, uh, 3 p.m. for Sunday, Shiloh uh, Missionary Baptist Church. Pastor Willie Buchanan is the pastor, and they've asked me to be the guest speaker at their annual um, Black History program on that month. So those who can and those who will, we certainly would like to have you with us. For those that are that may be uncomfortable getting out just yet. I want to tell you, no one will hold that against you, and we certainly understand. In the times that we are in, we want you to be safe. We want you to feel personally comfortable with getting out. And please, no one will certainly look down on you for staying home and for resting and for relaxing, especially those who may have uh, different high-risk factors. We certainly want to be uh, understanding and sympathetic to those in that type of situation. But right now, while I do have you, I want you to turn. There's going to be two passages we're going to look at tonight for our Bible study time. And it is Genesis chapter 22 uh, and Hebrews chapter 11. I want to make sure I had that. Genesis chapter 22 and Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, Sister Gardner, Sister Carmen Gardner, God bless you. I know many of you are ladies, I'm sure, are doing your chucks and your pearls. I bet not see a man with some chucks and some pearls on, but amen. I know many of you are doing your chucks and your pearls uh, in honor of uh, our first uh, African-American uh, vice president, Sister 
sister, <laughs> sister Kamala Harris. Uh, I believe it's because she's an AKA. I hope I got that right. If I have it wrong, please forgive me. Please don't don't send don't send the goons to get me. I'm I'm sorry. Blame it on my my mind and my memory not being good because of COVID. And I believe it was it the AKAs that had a annual day or a Founders Day not too long ago. I think so. If I'm wrong, please forgive me. If I'm wrong, please forgive me. I can't. I, I don't keep up with it much, so I hope I'm right. I'm sure if I'm wrong, someone's going to going to correct me. Uh, but Sister Verdi Davis, good to see you. Good to see all of you. Good to see my new Hebrew family here with me tonight. Um, it's six thirty, and just before we get started, we will begin with prayer. Uh, I want us to remember in our prayer. To number one, pray for the outgoing administration. Uh, pray that God keeps his hand on them, puts his hand on them, uh, blesses them. And pray for the incoming administration. Uh, to pray that God will put his hand on them, keep his hand on them, and bless them as well. Uh, we are to play, pray for those that are in rule and authority over us. Now, I'm sure as we go down this high road, this honeymoon period of a new president, new administration coming into office. It's not going to take long before the honeymoon is over and people are going to start complaining and we'll go back to status quo. Uh, however, as Christians, listen, we keep our eye on the throne. We press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling, which is found in Christ Jesus. Be respectful of whoever the local, state, federal, national uh, political leaders are, but never forget that we still worship a king. We serve somebody who sits high and who looks low. Vote your conscience. Vote to the best of your ability. Vote to what makes you feel comfortable, either party line, whichever side you are affiliated with, but never forget as Christians, our allegiance is to Christ above anything and anyone else. So good evening to you, Brother Tidwell, to everyone else who's with us, Sister Tim's and the Tim family. It is 630, so if you don't mind, we're going to bow for a word of prayer, and then we'll ask you to turn to Genesis chapter 22 and Hebrews chapter 11 for the Bible study period for tonight, our question and answer period. So let's, let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you with humble hearts, with thankful hearts. We come before you, Father, with joy in our hearts, knowing that you have brought us from early this morning to this point in the evening. You have fed us, provided for us. You protected us from so much danger, even though some negative things or difficult situations may have come up. We still trust, Father, that you have worked and allowed everything, Father, for our good. And now that we have made it to this time of study, Father, we pray that you can help us to give you our full attention. We need your word. There are some who are on the mountain, but there are also many who are in the valley. And so, Father, for the ones who are up and the ones who are down, we just ask you to bless, ask you to keep us humble. Help us, Father, to embody the words of Paul. When he said in no matter what state he was in, he learned how to be content. Help us to be content. We pray right now, Father, for the outgoing administration. We pray, Lord, that you can touch them, bless them, use them as only you can. You know the ins and outs of politics. And we pray for the incoming administration, that you would bless them, watch them, and keep them as only you can. Because, Father, your eyes are in every place beholding the evil and the good that men do. And even tonight, Father, we pray for our local church, for the members of New Hebron, for the friends of New Hebron, for the ones that just may be a guest and may be tagging on tonight just for a short while. We pray that this time of study, Father, for all of your people can be blessed. And if there be some, Father, that have not given their heart to you and accepted the free gift of salvation, that was paid for on Calvary's cross by the blood of Jesus. Father, soften their heart right now. 
Help them, help all of us, Father, to be humbled in your presence, to be used by you. We thank you, Father, and we praise you. We ask you this in the name of Jesus. And they all said or typed in, amen, amen. So I have a different cup tonight I'm drinking from. Um, I say this because I want it to be known. I want you to hear me when my mind is right and there's nothing wrong with my faculties is that, listen, I like the Cowboys. I prefer them over a different team. But I don't, I'm not in love with Jerry Jones, the Cowboys. Jerry Jones hadn't done a thing for me. And one of these days, my warm body's going to turn cold. Don't put a Cowboy star on the program for me. Don't even mention Jerry Jones. He ain't nobody in the scheme of things in my life. I'm nobody in his life either. I'm not a fanatic. I just like the Cowboys. So some people may tease me. Where's the Cowboy Cup? Where, listen, a cup is a cup. I just use that one because I prefer it. It was a special gift given to me. I appreciate the people who gave it to me. But uh, nonetheless, my hopes is in, the, is in Christ, not in the Cowboys. So tonight, we have a very good question. And I want us to take a very thorough look as we go into the Bible. I also want to say that I, I appreciate uh, all of you who submit your questions, whether it's uh, via the Internet, uh, whether it comes to me directly. I appreciate all of you who submit your questions. Uh, I'm humbled and I'm thankful at the fact. And I say that because, you know, people don't uh, have to trust you with giving them biblical information. I also want to say I am not the end all of all biblical information. I'm not. I am learning. I am growing. Learning God's word is a never ending quest. We can never get to the point to say I've arrived as if you made it to the top of Mount Everest of biblical information. So I'll be I'll make a deal with you. I'll be honest about what I don't know. And I'll also be honest about what I do know. Uh, if there's any mistakes, charge all those to me. Lord knows I am not in any way trying to lead someone astray, certainly not intentionally, but especially mistakenly. I don't want to say John if I mean Joseph or Joshua if I mean Jacob. Sometimes all the J's for whatever reason get mixed up in my head. So with all that being said, Brother Tim, good to see you. What do you say there? Uh, Reverend Abram, good to have you with us tonight. One half of the eighteen. You and Sister Abra. Now, tonight is a very good question, and, and it's, it's a straightforward and direct question. Was God going to allow Abraham to kill his son? Was God going to allow Abraham to kill his son? You can even expand on that. Was Abraham really going to kill his son? Maybe it was a bluff. Maybe Abraham was just going through the motions. And many of you, you may understand the background. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, the handmaid, the whole background. So what, what we'll do, Sister Milam, I see you. God bless you. What we'll do, let's turn to Genesis chapter 22. Since we're in Bible study, I can tell you Genesis is the first book of the Bible. For those that may not know, uh, for those that want to find it on your own, get your table of contents. So Genesis chapter 22. We're going to look at two sections of this particular chapter. Was God going to allow Abraham to kill his son? And even on top of that, like another question, if you could expand, was Abraham really going to kill his son? You know, now, now, now we must understand that Abraham uh, has a son that's older than Isaac, and that's Ishmael. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you recall, Sarah made a suggestion to her husband, Abraham. Well, maybe God, instead of me having a child with you because of your age, my age, reproductive systems, long, you know, been shut down because of just age. Maybe God meant that you should have a child with a younger woman. And we saw how that worked. That did not work. When Sarah looked around and 
saw that woman and, and, and Abraham with the child that wasn't hers, she said, somebody's got to go. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. So God was still even in that mist. And, and it's a lesson to us. It's a commentary to us about getting ahead of the plan of God. You can't hurry God. Sometimes you just have to wait on him. You can't rush God's plan because when we put our own spin on it, our own effort into it in that way, per se, when we try to reinterpret what the Bible says to fix out an outcome and we try to help God out, it only ends up in disaster. When you do things God's way, you get God's promised result. So they made a mistake. God finally blessed him. Boom. Gave him a son of his old age. The son of promise. After all he's gone through, God gave him this son. The son of promise. And when we get to Genesis chapter 22, I want you to look at verses 1 and 2 with me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Once again, we're answering the question. Was God going to allow Abraham to kill his son? And was Abraham even going to kill his son? So Genesis chapter 22 we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. And it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abram, Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. Verse 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, <clears throat> just a couple of things to bring the gravity home of this verse. It says, in this time, Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, God did tempt Abram. Abraham, oh, excuse me, I'm saying Abram. At this time, his name was changed to Abraham. And when it says tempt, it's a, it's a Hebrew word, nasa. It, it doesn't mean to entice to sin. It's translated that in the Old Testament, uh, the King James, which is closely related to the Latin. But the, the Hebrew word does not mean tempt like you and I would think. It literally just means to test. God tested him. God allowed him to be tested. You know, and God has to do that to us. Uh, not so he can gain information, but for our benefit. So we can learn really where we are when it comes to our devotion to God. So during this time, God tested Abraham. And here's the test. Take your son. That son you prayed for. That son you made a mistake trying to conceive. You had a child with someone that wasn't your wife. And you see how it messed up. You finally got him. Now here's what I want you to do. Take him and offer him to me. Well, how am I supposed to offer him? Well, verse 2 says, I want you to offer him to me as a burnt offering. Please, sir, please, ma'am, understand what this means. You have to know the gravity of what a burnt offering is in order for the verse to really have veracity and to live. A burnt offering was when they would take an animal, normally a lamb, but whatever animal it was, it had to be the best. You didn't offer God your leftover. You offered the Lord your best. I wish that mindset, Sister Verdi Davis and to the others who work with our you know, clothing ministry, I wish that mindset kind of prevailed a bit more. There's nothing wrong with giving away stuff that's reconditioned or old or used. But sometimes people just bring leftover. They bring things that nobody can wear. They bring things that have, I mean, you couldn't wash a car with it barely without it tearing up. And it's not that someone is giving their particular best. They're just cleaning out their closet. And when it comes to offering a burnt offering to God, you didn't just clean out your closet. You didn't just get the sick, you know, animal, <clears throat> the one that's coughing like me, the one that's hacking. No, 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 no. A burnt offering, you would take the best of your flock, an ox, a lamb, a dove, whatever it was. You would take the best of your flock, tie it to the altar. The animal would be kicking because you had to 
tie him to hold him there. While the animal was alive, you would take a knife, a sharp knife, and cut his throat. And while the blood, it, it was bloody, while the blood was spewing out all over the place and running down the altar, you would then set the body on fire. And somebody in a carnal mind said, well, what's the purpose of that? It was a way of saying with your actions to God, there is nothing that comes before you. There is nothing that I will put before you. There's no animal. There's no amount of money as we kind of enlarge that thought. There's no amount of money. There's no person, nothing or no one will ever take your place. I put the giver of the gift before the gift itself. The same God that gave me that oxen, when he requires it of me, he can give me another one. The same God that gave me this money, when he wants it back, he can give me some more. We are to show our total allegiance to God. And in this case, God told Abraham in a test, do this with your only son. Do this with Isaac. Do this with your child that you prayed for, waited for, patiently received, and now I want you to give him back to me. Sacrifice him as a burnt offering in such a gruesome way. That's why I said, verse one, the time did come where God did test Abraham or not tempt, but test Abraham. So what's instructive in verse three, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men. Abraham got up early and began to worship God in a difficult way, a way that was unthinkable for many of us. For me, I know for you too. Now, now, just fast forward in your mind. Just, just think about it. Just, just take one moment. We're in Bible study. Did God? really want him to kill his son. Was Abraham really going to kill his son? We looked at Genesis 22, verses one and two, and part of verse three, how verse three, he got up early. He went to worship God in this way. Listen, can you imagine coming back home? What is Sarah going to say? As he's coming down the hill, she sees him and she runs out to him. He's got blood on his hands. He smells like smoke. Oh, okay, you, you've been worshiping. Where, where, where's Isaac? Like she carried that child for nine months. I mean, there's a whole litany of thought that we could go into to kind of help bring this point home. So Abraham was about to obey the Lord in, in this special way. Now I wanted to jump forward to verse number 10. Jump forward to Genesis chapter 22. Jump forward down to verse number 10. And you know what? I'm going to start at verse seven, Genesis 22 and verse number seven. The question is, was Abraham going to crucify or not crucify? Pardon me. Was Abraham going to sacrifice his son? Did God really want him to kill his son? So we are answering that question tonight. And we're in Genesis chapter 22, verse seven. Abraham gets to the mountain and Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father. And said, my father, and he said, here am I, my son. And he said, this is Isaac speaking now. Isaac said, behold the fire and the wood. I see the fire and the wood. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? I mean, this indicates that Isaac was fully aware of what they were going to do. Apparently, as a father, Abraham had worshipped with his son, in times past, he didn't neglect to teach him what worship was to the point to where he knew specifically what type of offering was to be required. And he saw everything except for the main ingredient, which was the lamb. Now, even in that, hmm, there's a great lesson in that. And that is, you know, we ought to encourage and engage our children in worship. We, we, we ought to bring them to church with us, not drop them off and leave them. We ought to invest in their spiritual well-being, 
not farm that responsibility after somebody else. Abraham apparently did not do that. He knew that worship was important and he passed it on to his son to the point in verse seven, Isaac said, okay, I've, we, we've, I've, we've worshiped this way before. This is a burnt offering. I see everything. I see you got fire, you got wood. Where's the lamb? Verse eight. And Abraham said, my son, some kind of way God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both, so they went both of them together. Verse nine, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him upon the altar and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now, there's a lot that we could go into in just that little section there. I won't do it right now because Abraham was an old man. Isaac was a young man, vibrant man. Apparently, there was no struggle. Apparently, Abraham didn't have to chase him down and hunt him down. Isaac was a willing offering to lay on the wood because it stands to reason a 100-something-year-old man would have a little bit of a time with a young, you know, strong, you know, vibrant young man fighting and resisting him. Didn't have to hunt him, so he was a willing sacrifice. He's a type of Christ in that way. And so what he did was they came to the place, verse 9, where God had told him of. Abraham built an altar. He laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood, verse 10. And now here we are, verse 10. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He was going to kill him. Verse 11. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you has not, you have not withheld your son, thine only son from me. Verse 13, a verse that many of us are familiar with. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by the horn. We say a ram in the bush all the time. But a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Now, we're, we're not done. We do see that Abraham was prepared to kill his son, cut his throat, set the body on fire, and offer his son as a burnt offering to the Lord. Abraham was willing to do it. Was Abraham going to kill his son? The answer is yes. Did God require him to do that? The answer is yes. But, but there's another passage that we need to examine. Now turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to look at verses 17, 18, and 19. Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19. And once again, we see Abraham's name in what is called the Hall of Faith. By faith, Abraham, by faith, Noah, uh, by faith, Moses, by faith, Sarah, by faith, Rahab. It goes on and on in this particular chapter. All of these shining examples of faith. Now, when you get to the end of this chapter, I believe verses 32 or maybe 35, it said, and others. They were just as faithful as Abraham, just as faithful as Moses and everyone else. But they didn't have a beautiful outcome. They were faithful, but they didn't have the best of situations. But for right now, we're going to look at verses 17, 18, and 19 of Hebrews 11. The reason I bring this verse up is so that in this verse, the author of Hebrews gives us more insight into what Abraham was thinking, what was truly on the heart of Abraham. And it also gives us a very pertinent Bible study principle or tactic. The Bible is its own commentary. Just, you know, those of you who have a study Bible, you'll read your verses, you'll look at the 
verses in the margin. And I will bet you, some of you in your study Bibles, when you were in Genesis 22, 1 and 2 and 3 and, and 9 and 10 and 11, you probably had in the margin Hebrews 11, verses 17, 18, and 19. I will guarantee some of your study Bibles had that in it. And that is because the Bible is its own commentary. So we have another passage that shows us more insight into the story of Abraham when he was going, yes, he was going to kill his son and offer him as a burnt offering. Hebrews 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, gives a better understanding, not tempted or enticed to sin, but when he was tested, verse 17 says, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise, promises offered up his only begotten son. Verse 18, of whom it is said, speaking of Isaac now, that in Isaac thy seed uh, shall thy seed be called. Meaning, listen, Isaac was the promise. Isaac was the one that God was going to, he was the first step of many other steps to the Jewish race. Abraham is called the father of the Jewish faith because he was one of the first ones that trusted the Lord and followed him by faith. And so his son was the seed. His son was the next in line, his lineage. So we see verse 17, Abraham was tried. He offered up Isaac, his only begotten son, we see verse 18, uh, his son Isaac uh, shall thy seed be called. Now, verse 19 is our key. Here's what Abraham was thinking. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now, listen, listen. Abraham had so much faith. He trusted God so much. Number one, he trusted God that the child that he prayed for and waited for and even made a mistake trying to conceive had one child that he shouldn't have had, Ishmael, and then he had Isaac. But when he finally got him, he was so happy. And when he got that child, God said, now I want you to love your child. I want you to train your child to love me, to teach him biblical things, to teach him worship, which we saw in Genesis 22 that he did. Love your child, but don't love your child more than you love me. Well, how can I show you that I love you more than I love my child? Offer him as a burnt offering. And in the mind of Abraham, he trusted God and believed God and had so much faith in God. Hebrews 11 and verse 19 said, in the heart and mind of Abraham, Abraham said, you know what? I know how much power God has. I am going to kill him. I am raising my hand about to bring the knife down. And if that angel wouldn't have stopped me, he would have killed him. He would have cut his throat and set the body on fire. But behind the scenes, the program that was working in his heart and his mind was that if I kill him, God is so powerful, God can raise him up again. People, that's faith. That, that, Stay with me here. Faith is not a question mark. Faith is not a blind leap in the dark. Faith is based on the truth of scripture. It's based on what God says. And you trust God and lean on God and depend on God no matter what people have to say about you. No matter what the culture says and no matter how things look. So in the mind of Abraham, he was accounting. He was believing. He thought that out. He thought the process out. He said, listen, if I kill him, God can raise him up from the dead. And it says, from whence also he received him in the figure. It was kind of, that's just another way of saying he kind of was born and raised from the dead anyway. Reproductive system from an old man that should have long since be shut down. There's no way as an older man and my wife as an older woman. We should have had children at that age anyway. God already worked a miracle to give it to him. And if he did it once, why can't he do it again? If he gave us the child and we received him kind of from a figure, he, he's kind of born 
from the dead anyway because of my age and my wife Sarah's age. Surely if God did it once in the mind of Abraham, God can do it again. And so when we go back to our original premise, and I love this story about Abraham from the scripture. Was God going to allow Abraham to kill his son? Yes. Did God tell Abraham to sacrifice his son as an act of devotion? Yes. And in the mind of Abraham, what was he really thinking? What was going on? Did, did, did he raise his hand and just going to bluff God? No. In the heart and mind of Abraham, Hebrews 11, 17, 18, 19, he said, I believe God can raise him up again. That is a faith that is staggering. That's why he's the first, the father of our faith. And so hopefully that, that question, hopefully we got a good uh, um, uh, answer. Hopefully there's something that was beneficial in that that can be helpful to you along the way. And then let me encourage you in this way. And I'll say it in this way. You know, trust God more and more and pray for God to increase your faith. I mean, when it comes to just daily things, things that sometimes can kind of get us down. You don't have transportation. You've been trying to get transportation. Trust God. Now, now, now listen, be a good steward. Don't waste your money. If God blesses you with money to better your situation, don't waste it and just keep catching rides. God, like, I'm trying to bless you to where you can give rides versus take rides all the time. So, But the point being, when you get stuck into a situation so long, sometimes you can get kind of hopeless. You can like, man, it ain't going to be no better. You know, you, you never know. You might be the first one to start a business in your family. You might be the first one to get the PhD in your family. You might be the first one to go into political office. You, you just never know when you walk with God and you trust him, you know, pray about what he wants you to do. Don't make your mind up and then make God bless what you decided. No, pray about what he wants you to do, how he wants you to behave, what he may or may not want you to get into. And as God gives you direction, trust him. You know, but all that can stem from this story here about Abraham and things of that nature. So hopefully that was beneficial. That is the one question for tonight. Go ahead and put your sad faces on here. You're like, oh man. Like you mean you mean we can't go to 745 tonight? Not tonight. I I know you, you know. I know some of you got sad faces and you're pouting and boo-hoo and I get it, but you know, you can still take your Bible and continue to read even after we're done here. Just a few more seconds. So I'll close by reiterating to you again, uh, Lord willing, on the fourth Sunday. Uh, he's no stranger to us, Pastor Buchanan at Shiloh Baptist Church, 1200 Hanger Hill. Uh, he's invited us to come and to worship with them on the fourth Sunday in September. That's at three o'clock for the annual Black History Program. And he's asked me to be there. Uh, yeah, only one question. Yeah, he, he's asked me to be there, uh, the main speaker for that night. So those who can, we invite you to come. For those that do not feel comfortable just getting out in that setting yet, I promise you, do understand, and no one's going to look down on you because of that. Amen, somebody. That's, you know, listen, I can tell you from experience, this, this virus is nothing to play with. And you're, don't look at yourself as you're better if you get out and you're worse and you don't have faith if you stay home. No, no, I'm not. I wouldn't go that far to say all that. You know, every one of us have different risk factors and there's no cookie cutter way to get through this situation. So for those who can, we certainly, and those who are willing, we certainly, we invite you to come. We'd love to have you. For those who are more comfortable staying home, listen, we certainly understand that too, especially to many of our seniors. So keep that in mind. Uh, we're going to keep praying. Uh, Deacon Davis, Sister Davis, keep you guys in our fam uh, prayers. And to all of you guys, people, uh, please submit your Bible study questions. Uh, you can start as early as right now. Submit those via the email uh, email through the church website, newhebronlr.org. And since there's nothing else to kind of claim 
uh, attention. I enjoyed myself tonight. I pray that you did also. And we'll go ahead and shut down for the evening, giving you a chance to have a little bit of free time to go look at, you know, your Fox News shows and your CNN shows and everything else that you're going to be catching up on tonight. So it's my prayer that God will keep you safe and keep you under his wings. And I look forward to seeing you again, Lord willing, on Sunday morning uh, for our Sunday school lesson. Amen to all of you. God bless you.